The second question I was asked in my Microsoft interview way back in 1994 for a summer internship position was essentially string copy. It was, can you implement string copy? Now, I don't actually remember what the order of parameter was or any of those sorts of things, but since it was in the context of Microsoft, I'm assuming that it was written in the copy string care star from care star to kind of form where the from parameter comes first and the to second, unlike actual string copy where the destination typically comes first. But that really wasn't of any concern. The interviewer didn't really care about that part of it, obviously. It wasn't an API design question or anything like that. It was merely a question of, can you implement this? Now, this is very simple to implement, much simpler than number one, the rectangle copy, because a string copy is sort of like a one-dimensional, very simple copy. It's sort of like a subset of rectangle copy. The only real difference is you're not actually given the bounds for the copy ahead of time. You have to determine them dynamically by checking to see when you hit a null terminator, because as you'll notice, there is no count specified here. The assumption in those days with the C runtime library was that strings were null terminated and that somebody above you had already done the work of determining that this buffer would have enough room to hold the actual string you were copying. This is not a great assumption. If you look at what happened with buffer overruns and things that use the C runtime library, you will quickly see why this is not a great way to do things. And of course, I don't actually use this sort of code in my modern production work. I typically use counted strings specifically because they are more flexible for substrings, but also you're much less likely to have problems where you do buffer overruns. It's just usually a better way to go all around. But in those days, memory was at a premium, so passing around a bunch of counts um, and storing a bunch of counts was not really going to be necessarily a great idea. So you can understand why it used to work this way way back in the day. When I went to implement this on the board, I thought this was particularly easy. I don't remember exactly what I wrote. The most concise form, which is probably a little more concise than what I wrote at the time, would be something uh, like this. Start with an iterator, i equals zero. Do the actual copy here, so you would say to i equals from i, uh, and then just have your increment at the end. You can do it all in one for statement, it's pretty simple. And the reason you can do that is because you don't actually need to copy and check separately. This is a weird aspect of null terminated strings, but if you think about how it works, because you're supposed to copy the actual null terminator, that means you want to always do a copy and then check to see if it was null. Which means you can do things like putting the copy and the check into one expression. I don't necessarily know if that's the greatest thing for readability, um, but at that time, I don't know that I would have really thought about that. So I probably had something that looked like this, but I may have broken it out more. The int i equals zero may have come up. I might have had a while of this and the i plus plus inside the loop of the while. Something like that is probably more what I wrote, but either way, it's basically the same code. Now, the reason this question went oddly or went sideways a little bit for me is for some reason the interviewer didn't really like this. They prodded me a bunch of times and wanted me to change the way that I had written it. And I could understand if maybe they were driving me towards a more verbose solution that would perhaps be easier to read or something, although I think the one I wrote was you know, probably a little bit more verbose than this to begin with. But it turned out, no, they were actually trying to drive me towards an even more terse version. The version they eventually got me to write and then was like, yes, that's what I wanted, was this. This one actually does the increment, the assignment, uh, and the check all in one expression. Now, you may be thinking, well, why did they want you to do that? And that is also, to completely honest, what I was thinking at the time. I don't really know why they wanted me to do this. And I wasn't a very good programmer at the time, so I didn't really have the ability to ask any questions of the interviewer to find out really, like, what's the deal here? In retrospect, the only reason I could possibly see anyone thinking that you wanted someone to change from this to this would be if you somehow thought that this was going to be more efficient. 
But you'll notice nothing else re- about efficiency was discussed here. The interviewer never said like, oh, you know, do you want to copy uh, D words at a time or something like that? Uh, and then, you know, only downshift at the end or doing checks on D words or anything like that. And I'm not sure how much of that you really could have done either way, because it would depend on how much information you had about, you know, the the null terminated strings and things like that. So you could do some extra performance work here. You could definitely do some things related to that, but they were never mentioned in the interview. So the fact that they wanted me to write this specifically and didn't think that this was as good of an answer is very puzzling. And so... To this day, I'm just going to have to go with the fact that they must have thought that because this did not use an index like this, that it would somehow generate better code. I really don't know any other thing they could have been thinking. However, I'm not sure it actually does generate better code. The reason I'm not sure about that is because when I have done things like this in the past, now I've worked with C a lot, I've looked at compiler output a lot, which was not true of me when I was interning uh, or interviewing for that internship. I know that you can't really make any assumptions about compiler output when you do things like this. The compiler is going to take a look at what you said, and it's going to use a bunch of pattern matching and heuristics to output code. If you match a pattern cleanly in the compiler that it knows how to do something with, that will usually be the fastest code. So just because you think this uses an index and this doesn't, that may have no bearing on what the assembly actually ends up doing. And so I think the right question to ask here, if we could get into a time machine, is which of these actually generates better code? Was the interviewer actually asking their intern candidate to do something worse than what they had done? Because I was highly suspicious over the years that they may have done that. And I had no real way of knowing that. Except now that we're spending some time covering this because we're here in the intern question festival week, it means we can get back in that time machine and see Who actually wrote the better code that day on the whiteboard? Was it the intern or the full-time employee? Let's take a look. As you can see here, I have a DOS box up where I have actually taken the time to install the latest optimizing Borland compiler from that era. So this is the version of Borland C you might have had in 1992 or three. I went ahead and put in this test program where I put Microsoft's uh, version that, you know, that interviewer wanted me to type, the while star B++ equals star A++. And I put in the one that I wanted to do, which was the one that had the index. And again, I don't really know what the style would have been that I actually typed it in as. So I just typed in the most compact thing I could think of that happened to have an index. So if I go ahead and check the project options here, you can see that there's optimizations and I have clicked fast as code so that we will get whatever the compiler thinks is the best thing that it can do. If I then go ahead and do a uh, make, this will produce the exe for us. It will warn about those two things because man, Borland was on top of it. If I go ahead and run that, you can see that we both print the copied string. So it certainly looks like both of these are valid implementations of string copy anyway, at least as far as a simple test is concerned. So if I go back into Borland here, we've already built this, so I can go ahead and exit this, and we can actually look at what the disassembly was that the Borland C compiler produced. If I run the turbo debugger here, we can open up test.exe like so, and here we have our program ready to run. If I go into the instruction trace, we will see the disassembly, which is here before us. And if we go ahead and look at what the compiler actually produced, here we have my version. This is the stir copy Casey, as you can see. Here's the actual loop, because there's the jump if not equal, or which is also jump if not zero, right? They're the same instruction. If you go look at O2B7, that's right here. So here's the loop, inc si, inc di, move si to al, move al uh, to di, or the two together as the test and jump. It's almost the perfect code. The only thing it failed to do was fuse the ink and move into LODs and STAs, which I'm pretty sure 
would have been the right thing to do. Now, again, I am not an 8086 assembly expert by any stretch of the imagination, never wrote code for these processors, have no idea. So I will definitely defer to someone else here as to whether or not this is a missing optimization, but I think probably this would not be as good as if you had fused them together. But otherwise, it's really close. It's almost exactly the same code. It just misses that fusion that it could have done. Now let's take a look at what Microsoft ended up with. Here's its actual loop. Here's the jump down here. It's keeping DX and CX separately, but because, so just to give you a little bit of perspective about what tripped up the compiler here, when you do these mobs, when you're doing this mob here, which is a load, and this mob here, which is a store, you actually can't put anything you want in those brackets. That's an effective address calculation, and the 8086 only let you use a few things. So because the compiler decided to store these two pointers in DX and CX for some reason, and who knows what the reason is, it can't load directly out of them. So as a result, it has to do this pattern where it moves the pointer into BX so that it can do the address. Basically the exact same code as my loop, but it has two entirely superfluous mobs in it. So if we were gonna actually quantify these and we were gonna look at what is the cycle count you know, probably gonna be for these. So I don't know, because I'm not as familiar with like 286, 386, we could go look those up, but just since it's effectively exactly the same code, all you're really comparing is the cost of doing those two extra moves. And of course those two extra moves should cost two cycles a piece since they're register to register moves. At least that's my recollection of the 8086 cost. It might've gone down the 286 or the 386. So I think you're looking at four extra cycles every time through the loop for writing it the Microsoft way rather than my intern way. So not a good change. You're actually making the performance worse by writing it in that pointer addition form. The takeaway from all this is actually something that is still applicable today. In general, you don't want to assume that just because you've written something that you think will be more efficient in a higher level language based on the notation of that language, that that will somehow translate into more efficient code at a low level. You always have to look at the actual generated assembly language for whatever it is that you've written in order to actually compare these things. I don't think that particular full-time employee had ever actually done that work. And so they were just assuming that this would be more efficient when in fact it was actually less efficient, at least on some compilers. So you wouldn't want to go around telling people that they should start writing things this way because you really don't have the data to back that up. Now, this sort of thing is true today as well. You have to be careful about how you express things in high-level languages to make sure that you learn which ways of expressing things actually translate into efficient assembly language and which ones don't. But the good news is you don't really have to become an assembly language expert to do that. Just knowing basic assembly language and how it works is usually sufficient to see whether or not your higher level code is generating completely ridiculous output or generating something that's fairly reasonable. And in fact, that's the kind of thing that we cover in the Performance Aware programming course on ComputerEnhanced.com. So if you'd like to learn more about that, we teach all this stuff from the ground up. In fact, you don't even have to know any assembly language. We teach assembly language in the course itself so that you can learn to read modern assembly language on X64. That's actually it for question number two. Mostly it was an archeological expedition just to see whether or not the interviewer was actually right about wanting people to write it this way. And I suspect they probably weren't. Now, of course, neither of the two assembly languages generated for these two ways of writing the string copy were actually optimal. I believe the optimal way to do it would have been to use the LODSB and STOSSB uh, assembly language instructions, which for some reason the compiler didn't seem to want to do, even though it had lined itself up to do that almost exactly. So maybe there are some reasons why you didn't want to use those, although I can't really imagine what they would have been. However, I don't want to make any proclamations about that because I wasn't around back then uh, to program 8086. I was programming on an Amiga in those era days, and, and I don't actually know. So I have no idea maybe 286 or 386 changed the equation a little bit for those sorts of things. Uh, you would need someone who is an expert on those sorts of things uh, to say. So that's it. And I will be back here tomorrow for question number three, which is actually the most clever of the three questions, I think. And it's a really fun one to work out. And a great example of how people used to do SIMD-like operations even before SIMD instructions appeared in x86 CPUs. So I hope to see you back here for that. Until then, have fun programming, and I'll see you on the internet.